Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the editor in chief of semiconductor engineering. I'm over at Rambus with Stephen Wu, who's going to talk today about how the industry is addressing thermal challenges as a result of Moore's law. Steve, we've been hearing about a leakage. We've been hearing about uh, dynamic power density. All of that produces heat. What sort of problems has this caused for the industry? Well, Ed, there's really been a bit of a tug of war between the benefits that Moore's law provides, more transistors, and the fact that Dennard scaling, or the ability of power to scale down with each new generation, has basically stopped. And so this tug of war now exists between being able to do more with the transistors you're given, but how do you manage the increased amount of heat that these transistors are generating? Yeah, and if you think back 10 years ago, nobody even thought about power and heat. It was, was not an issue. Uh, things ran warm, you threw in a fan, and that was you were done. You can't do that anymore, right? That's right. And so um, whole systems need to be designed really holistically. You have to think about what it is you're trying to do, the environment that you're going into, and then how to deal with delivering power and dealing with the heat. So why don't you show us how this has evolved? I'd love to. So what are we looking at here? Well, Ed, you know, one really good market that illustrates this tug of war that I've mentioned is the graphics market, where over time, uh, we've seen dramatic improvements in performance, but also much more work and much more effort to deal with the heat that's being generated. So chronologically, how does this unfold? What are we looking at? Yeah, so what I have in front of me here is an array of graphics cards that spans about 25 years. And so this card right here is typical of a kind of graphics card you would find in the mid-1990s. What you see here is a processor that's doing the graphics, and you really see uh, no concern really about the heat. There's no fan, no big heat sink or anything like that. The thermal situation was uh, fairly easy to deal with. Well, if you fast forward a couple of years, what you find is that graphics started to become much more important and Moore's law started to come into play. Those graphics processors became more powerful, but along with that, more power and more heat were being generated. And so this graphics card that you see right here is really from around the 2000 to 2001 timeframe. Very typical of the kinds of cards you would see in that time frame. What started to happen was by doing more work, you now had more heat. And so people started to put more active types of structures in to deal with this heat. This particular case, there's a fan sink. You can see a couple of different bladed fans here and a radiator-like finned structure to help deal with the heat and help dissipate it. You can also see that the card itself is much thicker than the initial card from the, the mid-1990s. And again, you can start to see that more of that volume is spent dealing with the heat. Completely undoing the whole notion that smaller, faster, cheaper, it's now thicker, more complex, and probably more expensive, right? That's right. It's more difficult to manufacture with. And uh, in fact, you need to think mechanically about how you support a larger heat sink like this. And you can see on the back side, there's a mounting plate that helps it provide some mechanical stability for that thermal solution. Well, if you fast forward then a few years into the mid 2000s, this graphics card here is very representative of something you might see at the higher end from about the 2007, 2008 timeframe. The card now is much larger. You can actually see it's much thicker. In fact, its predecessor was only one PCIe slot wide, and you can kind of see it with this plate here. But the newer cards are actually much wider, and it takes two PCIe slots. And you can see that that volume is really dedicated towards helping uh, bring in cooler air and to manage the heat. Is this primarily the, the gaming market that this was used for? Well, things tend to start in the gaming market and in the higher performance markets like workstation graphics, but they eventually work their way down into the mainstream. And so what we find now is that even uh, within the kind of the middle markets, we're seeing uh, graphics card solutions that require more complex heat management. Well, if you fast forward to today, what you find is that um, the solutions for the higher end graphics cards um, are much larger than their predecessors again. And so this is a graphics card that uses GDDR6 memory. Again, it's about twice as wide. But what I wanted to do is I wanted to open this card up and show you how much of that volume is dedicated really to managing the heat. And so as I pull off um, this fan structure with three bladed fans, what you find underneath is a very complicated radiator structure whose job it is, is to remove the heat from this graphics processor, this uh, silver rectangular thing right here. What you see on this um, uh, thermal structure is you can see a copper plate, which is used to wick the heat away, 
and then it gets pulled into an area where there's a bunch of heat pipes. They're basically pipes with some liquid that draw the heat away over a series of bladed fins, and that's what the fans are blowing against, very much like your car radiator works. It's a way to kind of remove that heat. But the upshot of all of this is, so much of the volume these days is in dealing with the fact that power scaling stopped in the mid-2000s, and you can see that a lot of the weight and a lot of the volume is dedicated to just managing the thermals. Now we're starting to see this in data centers with training, uh, some inferencing as well, just more data to process. You have to get the heat out of the chips and out of the rack as well too, right? That's right. So that's why power efficiency is such an emphasis all across the board in our industry. The amount of work that's required and the amount of space that's required to actually deal with the heat um, is really growing over time and it's something that's really unsustainable in our industry. What happens when we get into battery power devices? Obviously you can't carry something like this around in your pocket, uh, may not even fit into a backpack. Where, where do you go with this? That's right. So uh, there's a lot of work that's been done over the years in the mobile industry to do things like to turn off parts of the system that are not in use and to quickly restart it when you need to change the mode of operation. And so this ability to keep some silicon dark for certain amounts of time and to quickly uh, turn it on while you turn off other parts of the silicon has been critical to managing the power and thermals for battery operated devices. We've also been hearing for a long time about things like microfluidics. Is that starting to become real now? Yeah, so there's a lot more uh, emphasis on using fluids to remove heat. And so if you take a look at solutions like the latest version of the TPU from Google, there's liquid cooling. And if you go to places like supercomputing, you see more and more machines at the high end that are using liquids to actually uh, move the heat in a way that it can be dissipated more readily. So now it's no longer just the device that's shrinking, it's also the movement of heat throughout the device as well. That's right, and so even uh, chip architects and memory architects are changing the way they design systems. HBM memory uses stacking to try and reduce the distances that data has to move and reduce the amount of heat and power that needs to be dissipated. I have a graphics card here though that shows um, even with those changes, there's still a lot of challenges with managing the thermals. This is a modern graphics card that uses HBM memory. And you can see, once again, it's quite thick and quite big, very similar to what we saw on the GDDR uh, graphics card. As I remove the fan cover here, what blows over the, um, the radiator structure, we again see a really large, really complicated kind of structure whose job it is is to wick the heat away from the processor. In this case, the board itself, where the work is done, is much smaller than what you see for the GDDR6 card, but the thermal solution is just as beefy, right? And so what you have here is the processor and two HBM DRAMs on a very compact board. But again, the vast majority of the volume is really dedicated towards dealing with the thermals. You can again see a copper plate, whose job it is is to wick the heat away from the processor and the memories and a, a heat pipe structure, which moves that heat across a, a large set of bladed fins. And the air flows over those fins to dissipate the heat. And you also have to be aware as you're moving heat that it doesn't end up in another part of a system that where that heat can't be removed too, right? That's right. So um, over time, from the mid 90s to today, uh, more design guidelines have come into play about how air should flow and where the heat should be moving towards in order to keep your entire system at a reasonable temperature. These look like fairly standard fan blades too. There are all sorts of new uh, designs for fan blades that are much more sophisticated than this, able to move out more heat too, right? That's right. So over the years, uh, people have gone from relatively simple types of fan blade structures like you can see in this card to something that's much more advanced. There's a big emphasis on efficiency of those fans, and so having relatively large surface area of the blades, but also being quiet. And so the design and the, uh, the angles and the way that the blades uh, are shaped in heavily influences the ability to both move a lot of air and remain quiet. And so those are big emphasis in, in the graphics market. How about the materials as well? So for example, the fluid that's moving through there, are there different densities that are better, at, at different materials that are better for moving the heat out than others? Yeah, in fact, um, you see this a lot in larger systems that you might find in supercomputing systems. There are inert liquids that you can even immerse whole uh, boards into. And because they're inert, nothing shorts out. Having that direct liquid contact with something that's inert is by far the best way to remove the heat. 
Uh, but there are other methods that people use, like these heat pipes and things like that, where they fill uh, with materials like uh, things that look mostly like water with alcohols in them or oils, things like that. We've known for a long time that things like DRAM are very sensitive to heat. How about the data moving to the DRAM? Does that potentially get affected as well uh, if you're whatever the conduit is for that, the interconnect? Well, um, you know, if you're doing things correctly, then you, uh, you're really designing so that the data movement doesn't get affected. And so um, as a system designer, what you have to think about is how much power is going to be dissipated at my target data rate, and then think about everything you have to do to make sure the temperature remains relatively stable and below a value that doesn't cause the semiconductor itself to degrade. Stephen Wu, thanks for a really interesting explanation. You're welcome.